Ed, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello, welcome to Gary Bald, you Ed. It's a case of played one, lost one for Nottingham Forest. They went down 2-0 to Newcastle United in their first Premier League game of the season. A pretty one-sided game and we're going to get into that and what happens next and discuss a bit of transfer stuff as well. First of all, in the company of BT Sport and BBC Radio 5 Live's Darren Fletcher. Fletch, welcome back. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm good. I'm um, reflecting on yesterday and excited for next Sunday in equal measure. Good, good. We'll talk a bit about next Sunday as we go on. But first of all, we better introduce our, se- introduce our second guest in Michael Temple. Temps, continuing your tour of various Temple locations. How are you? Good, thanks, Matt. Good to have Fletch talking about Forest again as well, isn't it? I know he rolls with the big boys now. And it's good to be back. Matt, he's his... done it for a while. Yeah, this is it. But in, in terms of the podcast on Monday and the bit he did with Jesse and everything else, it's, it's good to have a, a big friend in the media who clearly wants Forest to do well, but also has that that presence and that interest. So, yeah, good to have you back, Fletch. That's very yes, nice uh, of you to say. Very nice of you to say. And I hope as a fan, because I've seen one or two bits on social media criticising the team yesterday that I don't particularly like. I'm hoping that you're not going to be the temple of doom today. <laughs> That's how he got to the top. <laughs> right. Um, BBC Sounds, all about Nottingham Forest. I should give that a plug. It still stands everything that's in it, even though we've played a game. It's a, a good watch or listen, I should say, for 40 odd minutes in the company of Fletch, Steve Cooper, Joe Wall, Ryan Yates, and quite a few other people. Right. Uh, Fletch has watched in full, as has Temps. I listened and watched Match of the Day. Fletch, why don't you start us off just painting an overall picture of, of what you made of the occasion and the match? Yeah, I mean, I thought the occasion was fantastic. I mean, the, the the black and white flags all around St. James's Park before the team came out, fantastic. Um, before I talk about the team, I've got to mention the Forest supporters who you could hear out singing the Newcastle fans pretty much right the way through the game. So fantastic support, which I know the team value and I know the team are going to get all season. Um, in terms of, of what it was, Um, I mean, the statistics tell you that in the calendar year of 2022, I think only Liverpool, Manchester City and Tottenham have won more Premier League matches than Newcastle. There was a lot of optimism around Forest supporters, certainly ones I spoke to heading into the game, saying, look, look, this is a game they can win and blah, blah, blah. Newcastle are a good team. And I've got to say, I mean, watched that match yesterday. That's as good as I've seen them play under Eddie Howe. They got some big performances from some big players, Bruno Gimares in particular. Almiron and St. Maximan wide. I thought Willock was fantastic. Um, and I think what we saw yesterday is almost that welcome to the Premier League moment. Sometimes an individual has one where you kind of say to people, you know, what was your welcome to the big time moment? I think as a group yesterday, the team had that. They played against a very good and a very efficient Premier League team. I think they probably learned a lot of lessons. I think they probably saw quite a few shortcomings in terms of what they did and areas that they've got to improve. And the good news is they've still got 37 games heading forward to put it right, to work hard on the training pitch. And one thing you can say with certainty is that next Sunday against West Ham, playing on their own pitch, will be an entirely different experience for them and for the supporters too. If you think about how Fulham played at home against Liverpool and how Bournemouth played at home against Aston Villa, whether Forest survive or not this season is going to be decided at the city ground on that pitch in front of those full houses. So let's all just calm down a little bit. There's a long way to go. Players will come in. Lessons needed to be learned. The team needs to gel. We're off and running. I think Temp's looking at, I think the, I saw a map of penalty box touches and XGI and it only tells so much of a story, but I think Forest XGI was 0.2 and they had four touches in the box. What areas concerned you most and what did you make of it? It was just a lesson in the level, wasn't it, like Fletch says. So I don't think we're, we're particularly happy about any department other than keeper, perhaps. I thought Henderson's distribution was excellent. And if we thought that was the facet of Bree Sammer's game that we were going to miss, um, that's been rectified um, pretty much immediately. I think the back three, just a little bit overawed, understandably, perhaps, in that, that first half an hour. But they'll settle down and prove to be better players than they perhaps looked yesterday. Didn't have the, the foothold in, in centre mid that you, that you need. We were an away team. We're bedding players in, uh, but we weren't quite there, both with and without the ball. We weren't able to transition as quickly as, as we perhaps like, and we certainly weren't able to contain them. And the lesson in the level is players like St. Maximan, 
who's very, very talented, has been hot and cold. Joe Linton, who's been derided. They looked really good yesterday. And every team's got these players. And what you're seeing now is a Newcastle side with Eddie Howe's fingerprints all over it. The graft, the work rate, the, inten uh, the intensity, the structure. And Forest need to get those as quickly as they can to compete with the teams that are going to be in and around them. And as Fletch says, give everybody a bit of a, a game at home. So lots to do. I think lessons in, in all departments, but um, all is not lost. And if we'd have won, I wouldn't have been too carried away either. So let's just have a sense of perspective and crack on with trying to get our first point of the season. I think there are a, a few areas when you look at yesterday and that kind of need to be spoken about. Temps mentions the back three. It's a different scenario for Joe Worrell on the right, Scott McKenna on the left, to be put on an island against a Premier League wide attacker than it ever was in the Championship. Steve said to me when he spoke to me for the podcast last week, every game we play now is more difficult than any game we played last year. And any individual battle now is pretty much more difficult than any individual battle that a player had last year. If you're Joe Worrell and all of a sudden you're out there on an island against Alan St. Maximo, I've seen players with a lot of a Premier League pedigree struggle in that situation. You name the centre-back and they don't want to be on an island against Alan St. Maximo. And likewise on the other side, if you're Scott McKenna, you don't ever want to really be isolated on Miguel Almiron. And that's going to be a problem this week as well, because those players don't want to be isolated against Jared Bowen or Saeed Benrahma or, or somebody else like that. You know, potentially Maxwell Cornet. Now he's, he's signed for West Ham. The biggest thing that, that my takeaway would be, and I know that Steve realises there's a lot of work to do, and, and the squad know that as well. Nobody down there is under any illusion that this is the finished article and this is the way the team's going to be. When you put a team together like that, you need a month at least playing games, being out there on the pitch, learning what each other does, learning the system, learning what everything does so it becomes natural to you. One thing they do need to do from what I saw yesterday is keep the ball better. It's so difficult to get the ball back in the Premier League. So you've got to keep it when you have it. And I think yesterday, if you watch that game in full, there were maybe one, two, three passages of play where Forrest strung six, seven, eight passes together. They looked a little bit nervous in possession. Maybe that was partly to do with the occasion. But I think moving forward, the one thing I would like to see is a bit more confidence on the ball. They proved in the FA Cup run last season that they can play against teams in the Premier League. And I just think a bit of belief and a bit of confidence will help them moving forward. And if they can keep it better, then all of a sudden it makes it a different game. They didn't pass it very well, I don't think, at all yesterday. Yeah, you've got to be able to beat the press, haven't you, as well? I mean, Newcastle pressed high temps, and it sounded like listening on Five Live and just watching highs, we couldn't really, as soon as they pressed us, we, we gave it away, as, as Fletch said. Do you need maybe need an extra man in midfield there? And, the, and maybe you can't play the three lads up top, or are you just creating one problem by solving another one? Yeah, you've hit a point with the press. So Forrest in the Championship enjoyed the press because it enjoyed them, allowed them to exploit space in behind and make an accurate quick pass. We did some analysis before about McKenna's ball straight into the striker or straight into the midfield in space. What happened yesterday, the intensity, accuracy and teamship of the press meant that we actually fumbled in our own third and conceded possession. So if we are going to continue to adapt last season's game plan, we need to get up to the speed and the level because the intensity of the press is going to cancel that really, really quickly. I don't think Newcastle are the best pressing team in the Premier League, but they're far better at pressing any team in the Championship. And we, look, we looked nervous and unable to get a foothold in the game. And that first 15, 20 minutes was one-way traffic because we tried to play that way. We've got yeah. to adapt. We've got to adapt quickly. And that was a, a clear um, sign from the first 15, 20 minutes yesterday. We were going to struggle to, to just copy and paste from last season. I think as well that, you know, this is an away match. And... It's difficult to win away in the Premier League. If you're a good Premier League team, it's difficult to win away in the Premier League. Just go back and look at the numbers. Unless you're, you're Manchester City or Liverpool, all the teams find it difficult to win away in the Premier League. And I think a little bit of panic sets in when you see two of the newly promoted teams win and one of them lose. And you start to wonder whether you're as good as them and X, Y and Z. It's also the kind of league where I, I don't necessarily subscribe to the fact it's the best league in the world and go with the Sky Sports cliche, but I do think it's the most unforgiving league in the world. And if you're even 10% off it, you're going to come a cropper. And I, I was at Craven Cottage yesterday and Liverpool weren't quite there yesterday and Fulham played well. And that made that a very even contest. 
Fulham might have won it. Liverpool got a late goal, ended 2-2, probably about right. Had that game been played at Anfield, that's an entirely different proposition for Fulham, no matter how well they play. And, and you've got to bear in mind that Forest at the City ground are going to be so different to Forest at St. James's Park. So people can't get too concerned because it is difficult to win away in the Premier League. Forest will stay up based on how they do at home. No team gets into the Premier League and stays up based on what they do away. If they do, it's very rare. Maybe Sheffield United the other year had the kind of record that, that, that kind of argues that point to, to a level. But when they play at home, there'll be a different team. The game will be played in a different way. Teams won't relish coming to the city ground the way that Forrest, you know, maybe didn't quite enjoy going to St. James's Park yesterday. So there's got to be, you know, levels of reality around what happened yesterday what's going to happen this weekend, and then eventually how, when it all settles down, this season unfolds. And let's not forget, too, this is not the team that heading into November, Forest fans are going to see. You know, Steve, we saw 10 minutes of Mangala yesterday, and I thought the first thing he did when he came on was pass to a red shirt really effectively. One or two little subtle bits of movement that told you he played at the level where he felt, this is OK for me. I thought Musa Niakati... 1v1 as a defender looked really difficult to get past. Maybe struggled a little bit in possession, but that could be nerves. So you're going to see players start to develop as you go. And you see the team change as well. If they go through the progression now and sign Freuler, Gibbs, White, one or two more, and bring the quality in that they want to bring in, then all of a sudden you've got a team that's on a, a, more of a par with, with the teams in there. Because let's, let's – I don't want to kind of hog it, but, but let's not let, – let's get down to the brass tacks of all this. That – the players that Forrest have brought in, some have been brought in through necessity and some have been brought in to add quality. But they've brought in a lot of players costing 10 to 15 million pounds, which at Premier League level gets you to a certain point. Then after that, you need quality on top of it. Now, Jesse Lingard is the quality on top of it. You hope that Brennan Johnson can be quality on top of it. If they get Gibbs White and Froehler, Champions League player Froehler, good Champions League player, by the way, I've, I've commentated on at Atlanta games when he's been impressive against Liverpool at Anfield. Good player. Then you're talking about a different level of player. Then you're talking about a team progressing. Then you're talking about a team coming together because they get to know each other. So this is going to be a moving canvas for the first few weeks of the season. And anybody who makes knee-jerk reactions or snap judgments based on 90 minutes at Newcastle, I'm sorry, but at this stage, you're misguided because this is a work in progress and has to be seen as that for the coming weeks. There will come a time when you have to say, right, OK, cards on the table. Let's see what you've got. Let's see how good you actually are. And at that stage, you can probably start to judge. But until the manager gets the players in that he wants, settles on the team that suits him best, and everybody gets to know each other, you are going to get these peaks and troughs early in the season, and people have just got to ride with it. Yeah, we said on the preview, I think all four of us temps expected for us to start like this really quite slowly. Um, I spent all our time in our WhatsApp group droning on about midfield balance and all that kind of stuff. Um, Fletch mentions Guimaraes. I mean, he's a top four player for me and Joe Linton's a different player in midfield. Is it as simple as Forrest have to sharpen up in midfield and things will look a bit different? Or is it... Before you answer that, just cast your mind back to what Newcastle looked like before Bruno Guimaraes arrived. And that tells you that when Forrest get their quality in, the difference it can make to a team. He's the perfect case in point. 30, 40 million quid from, from Leon. Different team. Got a player that can do things that other people can't. Good teams in the Premier League need those kind of players. Yeah, that was Cooper's key message, wasn't it, in his um, post-match yesterday, um, talking about wanting to get new signings in. And I, I think the coded message is a number nine and two centre mids. Freuler and the number nine being the, the priorities for me. I'm starting to, to, to lose the value case with... Morgan Gibbs White, if I guess north of 30 mil, though I really rate him. Uh, and it, it may well come off. I may be proved wrong. I think those those are the two are probably the key for me at this point in time. But yeah, absolutely. You have to have a platform in centre mid. The way we launch our attacks, the way we transition requires quality and pace in centre mid. And the level has changed. Now, we'll get on to Lingard, I'm sure. But there were moments of quality that he had where those around him weren't quite on the same wavelength. There was the ball through to storage early on when he stumbled and couldn't quite get away. And I think the players that Lingard's used to playing with turned that into a shot on target. And there's the diagonal run where he, he himself got on the ball and had that, that shot blocked by the, the Newcastle centre-half. So I'd be excited by Freuler. 
I think we're desperate for another number nine. And I think the other coded message from Cooper yesterday is that Owen is not ready to start yet. He needs some work. He's got some good credentials. He's got some good attributes, but he's not going to hang his hat on his first season in the Premier League on him play, you know, starting 30 games this year. So signings required. Three bodies for me, two centre mids and a striker. I think the Gibbs-White thing is vital for more than one reason. I think ideally, when you see the way that Forrest set up yesterday, I think in an ideal world, Steve would probably like to play with two sixes and two eights and then a, a striker. And if you can't get the nine that's going to come in and give you quality, then you probably play Brennan Johnson through the middle and you play a Gibbs-White-Lingard combo behind him, which gives you pace, gives you flexible players, and then you play the two sixes behind, whether that is eventually Mangala and Froiler or those kinds of players, you've then got more of a base in transition when you lose the ball. The Gibbs-White thing as well is they've pursued him so hard at this stage, they've almost got to get him. Hmm. And as hard as they've pursued him, again, you're talking about cryptic messages, coded messages. I don't think there's any code about this. This is Steve Cooper's priority. He wants Morgan Gibbs-White more than anybody else. And I think he'll feel better as a manager if he's in the number 10 shirt, Jesse Lingard's wearing number 11, Brennan Johnson's in 20, and those three are doing what they do for Forrest in the Premier League. I think it's a real statement from club to manager if they get that deal over the line. Yes, if anybody's saying that Morgan Gibbs White's worth 50 million quid, which I read somewhere over the weekend, have another drink, then get a coffee, and then get back to us. But I think if Forrest have got to go, I read somewhere this week that was it 25 million down and then 10 million in add-ons. Mm. If Forrest have to get to 30 million down and 10 million in add-ons, it's always been this mythical 30 million. I don't see the problem with that because we've got to take Steve's judgment on it that he's the player that he thinks Forrest need to be good in the Premier League. And the flip side of it is Wolves, if we if we believe what we see today, are on the verge of signing Guedes from Valencia for about 27 million quid. Is there any coincidence in that? They get another attacker. Do they then think, right, we can now let Morgan Gibbs-White go because we've got this player? I think there's a little bit of brinksmanship here. I think there's a desire from the player to play at Forest, a desire to play under Steve Cooper, which is heavily weighted in Forest's favour. I would say from a betting man that that deal will get done before the transfer window closes because I don't, I don't see the benefit of Wolves keeping a player who's told them that he won't sign another contract when you've got... 30 million quid on the table, and he's not really kicked a ball for you anyway. It's not like they're losing anything. They're going to play for him. So Bruno Large clearly doesn't fancy him as much as he's trying to make out he does now. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sent him on loan last season to Sheffield United. So I, I, I might be wrong, but I think there's a bit of inevitability that Gibbs White gets done, comes to Forest, and, and forms that little pairing behind him and plays up front. Yeah, so an interesting one. I mean, Bruno Large is talking like he's his long lost son and he wants oh, to bring wow. him back into oh, the family. He's kicked a ball. He's never kicked a ball and now he's the best thing since sliced bread in, in, a, in, a, in a gold shirt. Mm. Unbelievable. My, my brother's a Wolves fan and a lot of um, my mates from, because I grew up in Shropshire, are Wolves fans. And they would have taken 20 million, 25 million. I said 30, and my brother said, I'll drive in there myself. Yeah. Now, obviously, Steve Cooper knows a bit more about football than my brother, but. I mean, is there a price where it's too rich, Temps? Or let's, 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 let's kind of bear that in mind. He's not really played for them. So if you're a Wolves fan, you, you imagine if this was a Forest scenario and there was a, a young player that we'd not really seen who'd been out on loan a bit and he'd done all right, and all of a sudden you get somebody who'll give you 25 million. Most Forest fans would say, oh, brilliant business, let's go and get somebody else. Because there's not really that connection between the Wolves fan base and Morgan Gibbs White his best football has been played out on loan. So they've never mm. really seen it. Of course, there is a point where you've got to say, that's too rich. And, and we're getting towards that point, I think, if everybody's being honest. But I don't think they're quite there yet. And I think there's still a bit of leeway in those conversations. And I think that when a manager's been so adamant that he wants a particular player, there's obviously a damn good reason behind it, Temps, as to what Steve sees his Forest team looking like with, with Morgan Gibbs White in the team. Yeah, Flesh makes an articulate argument there about uh, Cooper's position. Um, he's yet to sign his contract. And, and you're right, the, the ownership want to give him what he's asked for because he's delivered on the promises he's, he's made to them. But for me, if you want to put a number on it, Matt, it's 30 mil. 
And I think a penny more is too much, and we have to look elsewhere. And think penny. better. Well, so, yeah, all right, okay, okay. So you, so if I said to you, I'll tell you what, Seb, this thirty mil. If you give us thirty-two, you go. Yeah, right then. <laughs> all right, look, you, you've never seen me on Football Manager, Fletch. My first price is my best price, and and that's that. But look, what a player! Great in the championship last year. Looked really good against us. Are there other players in the market that can um, accentuate his positives and be a similar player to Morgan Gibbs? Why? I think there probably are. And you've spoken about the amount of 10, 10 to 50 million players we've had and what that buys you in the Premier League. I think 30 million quid in Europe gets you an awful lot. And Mane is a bit of a weird example because of the gentleman's agreement and, and the kind of circles he's mixing in. But there are some serious, serious players that have changed hands in Europe for 30 million quid. And I think, at the very least, we need to have plans B and C, should okay. MGW not be ours. OK, OK, right. Let me come straight back at you, because this is what we're here for. Everybody else is arguing while we're talking. Most people think I'm talking nonsense, so that's OK. You're in good company. Right. So, 30 million gets you a lot in Europe, right? You've just made the point. Taiwo Awani costs £17.5 million. Pounds. And yesterday, Sam Surridge started, because he's not settled... Yet, and you've just made the point. You don't think they're going to pin their hopes on a season in the Premier League on him just yet. If you go into Europe and you spend the thirty, yes, there are bargains. But if you know a player as well as a manager knows the one we're talking about here in Morgan Gibbs White, it makes it more likely, surely, that that player is going to be a success. There has to be more of an element of risk based around going and spending that kind of money in Europe on a player that hasn't played in the Premier League before. What's the motivation for him coming? You know that Morgan Gibbs White's motivation is he's very close to the current Forest manager and he, he wants to make his way in the Premier League. So you know that his motivations are good. What if you go and sign somebody for 30 million who's a, a nice name? And the reality is they're quite fancy in the Premier League. Forest are going to pay him a decent wage. Not really that kind of dialed into the project in general. There's then a bigger risk than what you're doing within your own country, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, he's got two years at Wolves, not one, hasn't he? So there's a bit of a risk for them. If they are going to build a, a midfield around him and Neto and he plays 15 games and struggles, then that's that's no good for, for anybody. So really interested to see how he plays, how the coach integrates him, makes him more of a focal point in that side after whacking him out on, on loan last year. And you know, don't get me wrong, I would celebrate that signing as, as much as anybody. But if that creeps towards 35 mil... I think we'd perhaps live to regret it. The thing is, what, 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 what figures are we case. talking about? But it's not your money, is it? So why does it matter? If the owner's prepared to pay it, why does it matter? He's got to carry, he's got to foot the bill. He's got to, he's got to decide. He owns Olympiacos. He gets a few quid for shipping things around the world. He's just got £190 million for getting in the Premier League. If if he's prepared to pay, why, why would people worry? Why do fans always say, oh, I've got a, I've got a ceiling? It doesn't matter. Nobody turns around and says to Manchester City, well, I wouldn't spend 100 million quid on Jack Green. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. That's what they want right. to do. And if that player is seen as the finishing touch for a, for a coach, the owner can then turn around as well, if you flip that on its head, and say, well, look, I've given you everything that you want. Now you've got to go and make it work. That, that then puts a bit of pressure back onto Steve because the owner says, well, that was the player that you wanted. I probably overpaid, but I've got him. So now let's go and see what we're all about. And then Steve says, OK, I'll take that challenge. You've done your bit. I'll do mine. Everybody's then working in harmony. But I, I, I wouldn't get too carried away over four million here, five million there. I, w I wouldn't worry too much because this is they, they say this is part of a long term plan. And if if they did spend 35 and stay up this year, nobody's going to say at the end of the year, oh, that still shouldn't have done that. They're going to be saying, brilliant. I'm glad we did it. Otherwise, might not have got the point. So. It's a difficult one to debate on when you stop, provided the owner says we're all right. If the owner's going beyond his means and you know that there's a fall coming at the end of the year, then, yeah, pump the brakes. But if they're all right, just within reason. Hmm. Yeah, look, that's, that's it, isn't it? So the, the 18th richest owner in the Premier League is spending more than anybody else. So we're not quite sure what his means are. It's deeply that's impressive what he's done to this point. Yeah, but we, you can only spend time and money once, right? And 
the, the recruitment team at Forest is celebrating just as hard behind the scenes. They've shipped 12 boys out as they are about pulling 12 boys in because everybody that sits there that's racking up a weekly wage, not contributing, training with the 23s, can't even park the car in the car park, is a drain on the club, drain on resources. I love Morgan Gibbs-White, and I, I feel like I'm, I'm in the negative one here. I'm really not. I'm really not. Let's get him in. Fletch is right. Spend 50. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. But the thing is, you know, you know when people call it, but this is, if a club wants to be in the Premier League, this is what you've got to do. And the ones that come up and don't do it go straight back down again. And then they take another year in the championship and they come back again and they're not good enough again. And they go down again and they come back up again. They're not good enough again. Some stage you've got to say, we want to swim in the big pool with the big fish. So you've got to act like one. And all they're trying to do, I think, is to put a squad together that puts them in that group that gives them a chance. And, and that the team that they came up with last season, minus the loans, was nowhere. Nowhere. And what they've got to do, if they want to stay up, and they see this as an opportunity to, to not only stay up this season, but they, they want to stay up next season and, the se and continue to develop the ground and eventually become a team that can be a top-half Premier League team legitimately based around, they think they've got a fan base that can help them do that. You know, there's the potential, when you see how many people went to Wembley, you could see Forest playing in front of 45,000, couldn't you, for home matches? Because that fan base exists and the passion's there. So I think they're looking at it saying, look, if we're going to go step by step, have to have a group of players that can play in the Premier League. And that, that costs a lot of cash when you're coming from where Forest are. And also, Matt and I have talked about this a long time, and you will have done temps as well with, 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 with your Forest supporting mates, etc. They're paying the price a little bit for bad recruitment way back when. So they've got a lot of square pegs in round holes or did have that you know, just didn't fit. So a lot of that has had to go too. So it wasn't as if Steve said to me the other day, he said, in an ideal world, we would have got promoted. I would have added two or three and then away you go because we've got a nice solid group. But that's not been the case because of the number of managers they've had, the piecemeal recruitment policy they've had in the past. And now they're trying to get joined up in a hurry. And that's why I think you've got this, this situation that they've got now. It's not, not something they would have wanted, not something they're necessarily welcome, but they've just had to do it based on circumstance. So let me throw a mucky then, Flesh, about the, the strikers, right? So Keenan, player that Cooper rated really highly, and you, you know Stevie G really well, so I don't want to put you on the spot of any inside info, but we moved on from that player when the price became unpalatable and went for another player who was perhaps fancied more by the technical department than the, than the head coach, perhaps. We're not on the inside of the club, we don't know. But when, when does that point get reached? And what are the internal dynamics on when you pull that lever, when you move on, or when you slap your best off on the table? Because that saga, the, the Morgan Gibbs White saga, seems to be being handled slightly differently to our pursuit of the, the marquee striker. Yeah, I think it depends on the desire within the club for the individual player. And it kind of goes back to the point I said that I think Steve's made it quite clear that his priority is to somehow get Morgan Gibbs White into the club. So that's a priority for the manager. I think in terms of the number nine, I think there is a price that Steven Gerrard would take to sell Keenan Davis. At the minute, Keenan's the number three at Aston Villa behind Danny Ings and Ollie Watkins and is going to stay there. Whether that price for a player that hasn't scored goals in the Premier League, and there is a there is a tape to look at of Keenan Davis in the Premier League. You can see the way he plays in the Premier League. Um, and it's easier to score goals in the Championship than the Premier League. Alexander Mitrovic will tell you that. Um, so there is that little paper trail to follow as well. And also, he was injured over the course of the summer. So whether that's been a hindrance as well, the fact that he's not really kicked a ball for Aston Villa since the end of last season at Forest, that might be the reason that they've gone down that route. There is also the possibility as well that Steve might foresee a shape for Forest where Brennan Johnson plays through the middle with Lingard and Gibbs White behind. And then Brennan Johnson becomes your number nine. It's a different type of number nine and it's a different type of front three but it might be an effective way of doing it. So maybe they think that if they get the pieces around them, the man who will eventually be the number nine, he's already at the club. And that might be, I don't know, I'm just kind of guessing based on joining the dots, that might be the situation that they see, that maybe they feel they want another striker. Maybe they go for the fellow from Holland. I can't even bring myself to say his name because he's <laughs> brilliant. 
maybe they bring in someone like him who we don't really know and they hope that it works. But maybe Brennan Johnson becomes that that central player with two players playing off him that, that gives Forrest that opportunity to be really quick on the counter-attack in the Premier League as well. So there's a number of of reasons that I give, all based on my personal opinion. I don't know anything. I, this is me making it up as I go along, as I always do. But that that's the way I'd possibly see that. Mm. Yeah, and Davis is number four at Villa, isn't he? Because Cameron Archer's well, yeah. Him. yeah. So, but like you make a good point about he hasn't kicked a ball, so it's hard to bring him in. But he does feel to me. I, I'll ask you this one, Temps. Do they need a Davis type player because that attacking balance wasn't there against Newcastle? It's only one game, obviously, but they do need to find that formula. So maybe it's a Davis type player, and you pin the ball up to him, or. You play a Brennan type and two players off him and you're very busy and very fluid. But they need to find a different form. It's what we had against Newcastle, didn't they? Yeah, we spoke about strikers of the back goal, didn't we? And, and Surridge's first pass out was often wayward. And he needs to adapt quickly if he's going to be um, anything more than an important squad player for Forrest this season, I think. Keenan Davis was much more adept, albeit in the Championship, at holding the ball up. And lots of examples of existing Premier League players who can do that. Back to goal. Pinged pass in from a McKenna, in from a Worrell, get it under, find a midfielder, build from there. And I don't think either Taiwo or Surridge are particularly adept at doing that, or were particularly adept at doing that um, in the preseason friendlies we've seen in the, in the first game of the season. I like the Johnson theory. I think his the sky's the limit uh, for him. Pace, poise, uh, the one touch finishing of Surridge is something else. But how many one touch goals has Brennan scored in the last two years? And, yeah, I, I, I do. I, I think that's going to be really, really important. We need to find a better way to retain possession, to get up the pitch and to get those two players off him. And I think Fletcher's theory about having Morgan Gibbs-White and Lingard um, hovering in the hole would be better suited to having an out-and-out -out target man ahead of them who can get them off them and get the flicks down. Time. And being able to, yeah. to be released, to run beyond as well, as we often saw Lingard do off Mikel Antonio at West Ham. Just on the Surridge theory as well, when you kind of look at Keenan Davis, I think if Keenan Davis could finish like Sam Surridge, then he's, he's absolutely nailed on. The Achilles heel for Keenan has always been putting the ball in the back of the net. If Sam Surridge could hold the ball up and you could play into him like you can Keenan Davis, then Sam Surridge is a no-brainer. I think you'd almost like a mix of the two. Maybe Forrest look at it as well. Why Surridge is kind of out there a little bit more is that apart from the header yesterday that he should have done better with when he headed it into the ground, if there is a feeling that he's a better finisher in games where Forrest aren't going to see as much of the ball, maybe that could be a deciding factor for him over someone who might need a higher ratio of chances to score those goals. Mm, mm, true, true. Uh, right, shall we move on to West Ham, who are, are they playing at the moment? I can't even remember. Well, they're, they're, playing, oh, they're playing Man City, aren't they? Yeah. Yes. So as we record it. So it's obviously going to be a great occasion. Is there an extra onus on the game already, Temps? Because then it's Everton next, and you don't. Will want to you behave? Play. Will you behave? There's 38 games in the season. Yeah, right? I know. But then you now, hear me out. Then okay. So then it's Man City and Spurs, and you could lose right. that, and you don't you want to be play playing all of them, away, all of them, huh? over away. What? Yeah. When when you get the when when you get the points isn't important, but I think we'd all like to get that first point, settle the nerves. And Cooper's big buzzword pre-season has been belief. Making these players feel they're not there to take part, to scrape 17th. They're there to compete and believe. He adds value to players. Now, that method is at its most successful when you're winning games. And the momentum he built last season, having sparked it from nowhere, was incredible. And I think we'll find points easier to come by when we get our first points on the board. So, mm. yeah, it's a big game from that perspective. And if, if we drew with West Ham, beat West Ham, fantastic. And I think then Peckers are up going into that run of tough games against Spurs and Man City. Bournemouth and Everton, they have to take in, as we've, as we've said before. So, yeah, there is a lot on it. But we're not going to sit here doom and gloom if we lose that game because we're gelling a team, we're gelling a squad. We're finding our feet. We're working on formulas, working on combinations and still trying to get three through the door. So it's not a disaster if it takes us beyond the West Ham game to get our first points on the board. But I think Cooper's method, the belief he's instilling, will be perpetuated if we can get a result at home next week. Yeah, I can see Fletcher's itching to come in and shoot me down. But that's that attempts to articulate my point there. If you get a point or two, a point on the board or three against West Ham, 
it sets you up for that Everton game because Everton looked totally toothless against Chelsea yesterday. And I thought Chelsea were pretty average as well. So you can go into that game and pick something up. And then you don't, if you get four points next two games, you don't need to worry quite so much about Man City and Spurs, who are obviously a cut above. And then it just changed the dynamic of the season. But I agree totally. If they lose to West Ham, fair enough. I said they're going to get, you know, five points from the first six games. And that's a good return. So I'm not being fickle, but I just feel like it'll be a real bonus and real, you know, to, to round off the day of celebration with an actual tangible result, Fletch, is what I'm going for next next Sunday. Look, everybody wants to see Forrest win games in the Premier League. Everybody. But it's no good at this early stage of the season adding pressure to the next one and the next one and the next one because it's just going to become unbearable for the group. You know, this is a team finding its way. Newcastle didn't win till December last season and finished 11th. You can do it. I know it's easier if you make a good start, but you don't have to win two of the first four or three of the first six. You don't have to. You've got to get 36, 37 points after 38 games. And all I would say is, I think, I don't know, but I think, based on what I saw last season and based on what I know about the fans at the City ground, Kevin Nolan was on the radio with me on Friday and he said, I'm gutted that we've got that fixture. He said, the last thing we want is to be the first team bowling in there. And he lives in Nottingham, so he knows all about it. And he wants Forrest to stay up like anybody else. And he said, the last thing we wanted was to be the first team to walk out in there knowing what it's going to feel like, what it's going to sound like. So West Ham are concerned about this fixture. What if West Ham lose to Man City this afternoon? Then they come to Forest next week and get a bit of a tickle at the Trent end as well then next week. All of a sudden, David Moyes has got a problem. Because who's next on his list? They're all in the same boat. But I think next week, based on what I saw last season, based on what I know about this wonderful fan base, it will be an entirely different game next week. The team will be rolling along with the crowd. The team will be feeling the vibe. They're going to be keen to impress. They'll find an extra 15% in the tank in front of the crowd. It's just going to be different. West Ham aren't going to turn up next week and dominate the match like the Newcastle did yesterday. It just won't happen. I'm going to stick my neck out and say it will not happen. Forest will generate chances. They'll play a different way. I think they'll play quicker. I think they'll get the ball forward quicker. I think they'll have more territory. I think the entire game will be different. And I think if we start to compare West Ham at home to Newcastle away, we're almost looking at two completely different scenarios. So I, 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 you know, I, think, I think whether they win or whether they don't next week, next week will be a good indicator of what home matches are going to look like as, as they go. Because as I say, Forrest can win eight or nine at home. They don't need a great deal on the road then. You know, you're going to, Laura Vavages says you're going to nick a couple. And then you're giving yourself a chance. What I would say, though, as well, I've got to get this in because it's been winding me up all summer, right? For anybody that seems to think Forrest are going to finish 10th or finish 9th or finish 11th. Where's <laughs> Greg Mitchell? Listen to this. This is a ridiculously difficult league. This is unlike anything else. There's no league in the world that is as difficult as this. And again, I'm not saying it's the best league in the world, but I'm saying you can be 5%, 10% off and you're getting beat. This is a hard league. There was a, a thing on social media, I think Sports Bible did it, three words to describe what you want from your team this season. And I put 17th is enough. And it is. Season one, you've just got to stay up. And people have got to realise this is going to be a rocky road, peaks and troughs, maybe more troughs than peaks. Enjoy it for what it is. Fingers crossed that by the end of the season, they've got enough to keep their heads above water. And if they do go a bit further than that, that's a massive bonus. But kind of see it for what it is. This is a ridiculously difficult league. And if anybody didn't know that, just look at Newcastle yesterday. They're going to be 30 points behind Man City or Liverpool at the top. That's the gap that they've got to find. And we're getting a bit worried because they beat us 2-0 yesterday. 2-0. And by the way, when it was 0-0, if Jesse Lingard scores that chance across the goalkeeper, that could be a different day yesterday too, by the way, despite the fact that we ended up getting done by two world-class finishers. And they were world-class finishers, by the way. So it, this is hard. So let, let's just kind of take it for what it is. Pump the brakes. Relax. Just, just chill out. Come on. This is one game. Lost at Newcastle 5. West Ham to come. Great day. Let's enjoy it. Come on. Mm, true. I mean, Bournemouth beat Villa and now, you know, it just changes the perceptions, right. doesn't it? But Bournemouth are going to struggle. 
I'm not well, I'm not too sure Villa are going to have the season that they might have been hoping for. Matt, but Matt, I, I, one game. Matt, I did yeah. Fulham yesterday. Right now, Fulham's next two games are Wolves and Brentford. Do you think brilliant? Go and have a look at what they've got after that. I think they play yeah. Man City. I think they play uh, played Liverpool, Man City, Tottenham, Chelsea. They've got this run where you think they might have seven points from the first three and they might have seven points from the first nine at the end of it. You know, it's like mm. it, it's all going to level itself off at some stage. Forest mm. are just going to do what they do. And it, it is going to take a bit of time. But the home form, you know, Temps, it's going to feel totally different in there on Sunday. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I like the nuance. I don't want anyone to come off at the back of any Forest game saying it's terrible or it's unbelievable. There's there's so much debate and nuance and things to work on and things to tweak and individual lessons as well. I, I don't think Nico Williams and Joe Warrell will ever give their yellow card away as cheaply as they did yesterday because they'll have had a little word with themselves. There's a thousand lessons been learned yesterday. And I, I, I'm with Flesh in the sense that we should look at the league table after 10 to 12 games and start thinking about how we've done, how we've how we've levelled up in the departments we thought we were strong, if we're still crying out in the areas where we're, we're perhaps not so strong. But yeah, let's just have that that balance, that that sense of nuance and carry on these great, sensible debates without ever saying Forrester unbelievably good or terrible because it's never true. And if that, yeah, if there's one thing Twitter teaches you, it's, it's that these polarised opinions about every player, manager, and team in the world. And commentators, by the way. And commentators. Commentators too, my friend. I'll lend you my timeline after a Man City match. You'll, you'll, you'll laugh. Yeah, I'll tell yeah. you what. You know, I mentioned we got Kevin on the radio the other night. I said to Kevin, what's the key for a newly promoted team? Because obviously he's got up with Bolton and stayed, up with West Ham and stayed, up with Newcastle and stayed. So he's a perfect man to talk about it. And he said, Sam Allardyce always used to say, and he did the... He crunched the numbers on it, Sam, that if you've got 10 points from your first, or 15 points from your first 10 games, the numbers say you've got a 70% chance of staying in the Premier League. Now, 15 from 10 seems a lot easier than six from four and things like that, doesn't it? But it also means that if you haven't got 15 points from 10, you've still got a fair chance of staying in the, still 30% chance you're going to stay up anyway if you get on a bit of a roll. So, there are there are ways of looking at it, kind of blocks of fixtures or or, or whatever it is. But I, I, when I interviewed Stuart Broad for the the podcast last week, I said, "Will you be able, regardless of how it unfolds, to just enjoy it for what it is?" And everybody I've asked said, "Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's been twenty three years. Going to enjoy it, no problem." Two nil at Newcastle. And I went on social media last night, and I'm like, "Oh, yeah. where have you all gone?" All the people promising to take it for what it is, they're like doom and gloom and, oh, this is bad and that's bad. Come on. Yeah, that's football fans, though, isn't it? They say, oh, we'll take a table, yes. mid-table consolidation. If you're not in the top six, the manager's got to go after 10 games. Yeah, it's so brilliant. I mean. it's brilliant. Um, right. So, uh, any tactical changes for you? Because nothing's changed for me, Temps. I've always said Forrest are going to struggle but to start with and finish 15th. And I'm just going to stick totally by that prediction. Of, you know, it's just one game, but... Against West Ham, any tactical changes that you might make? Maybe near Kate goes to the left. Maybe you change something up front in terms of selection. What would you do? No, nothing knee jerk at the back. I think ultimately that's the personnel for the for the back three. I think that the midfield five, we we've still got some recruitment to do there because the plan wasn't to start the season with Toffolo on the left. Richards was going to be there. Um, and the plan wasn't to start the season with 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 callback centre mid. I, I would wager it, it would have been Yates or Mangala if he'd have been in a little bit earlier. So I think there's a there's a selection dilemma centre mid. I think Mangala probably comes in. I'm really interested to see what happens with Surridge because he's been selected for me to just emphasise that political point that when he's not quite ready. Um, I just wonder if we might might see him at home. I think we'll still have two up top, and I just wonder if. If, if Surrey didn't show quite enough against Newcastle. Back three ringed in for me. Keepers inked in for me. I think there'll, there'll definitely be a change centre mid. And I'm 50-50 as to what I expect to see up front. Gibbs White, £50 million pound man. Well, I, I yeah, that's, that's the deadline day thing now, isn't it? We won't know their real well, price until deadline day. Not necessarily. Yeah, if they say it's from Valencia, they may say, well, go on then. It's fine. Because they've yeah. got to be careful as well. If they don't sell Gibbs White this summer for this money, they're never getting offered this money again. This is it. This is a one-shot deal for them because the contract runs out. 
at the end of next season. You yeah. start to get into January and you're not going to pay 35 million then for a play with 18 months left to run. And then by the time you get to next summer, you're talking very, very smaller figures than that. I mean, I think Temps makes some great points. I, I don't know whether it's a little bit harsh on the strikers based on yesterday, simply because they weren't in the game. So I think to take Surridge out for our knee or whatever, Surridge had one chance, really. So I, would that be harsh? I think if, if he was going to do anything, I think they've got, I said right at the top of the podcast, I'd like to see them pass the ball better. I think when Mangala's got an extra week in his legs, I think there's got to be a role for him. I thought Jack Colback played well yesterday, I've got to be honest. And I think when you play against West Ham, you have to fight fire with fire in there against Declan Rice and Socek. You need someone that's going to get around and be disruptive. And I think I'd keep Colback in and I'd play Mangala next to him. Likewise, you know, Lewis O'Brien's had hernia surgery over the course of the summer. He's maybe a little bit further behind. He'd like to be at this stage another week on the training pitch with his teammates and he might look a different player. So I think it's difficult at this stage because we don't actually know what they're all looking like and, and what it's going to be like week to week as they start to develop. The next five days on the training pitch, O'Brien might come on more than Mangala. Then it makes up Steve's mind next week. Um, I think incomings are going to dictate changes. I was a little bit concerned. I've got to be honest here. I've got to be honest Yes, I, I don't want to dig anybody out, but I was... I, I was a bit concerned about Toffolo at Newcastle. I thought Toffolo really struggled. Didn't look comfortable. Didn't pass it. I just looked at him and thought, I could see why he's there to back up Omar Richards. And I can see why the club have said over the last few weeks, we could do with another left wing back now that Richards is out. I was thinking all the way through those stories I was reading. Well, what about Toffolo? Because Williams can play that side as well if you've got anybody else to play on the right. But when I saw him yesterday, I thought that looks like a player that needs a bit of time to settle. I'm not saying he's not good enough for the Premier League. I think he probably is. But I think at this stage, the idea was to probably not play him. And I, I, that position for me is 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 interesting, very mm. interesting. Because if if you if you end up with Jared Bowen out there or or, or whatever, it's it's a difficult job to do out there. So yeah. that. That was the that was the thing that concerned me most. I could see the others need a bit of time or a bit more fitness or whatever. That position worried me at Newcastle. Yeah, well, that's why I said move near Kate to the left because if Toffler gets beat, near Kate is a good one on one defender. He's got the pace. We saw with Warhol yesterday; he, he was struggling against Sam Maximan with Nico Williams pushing on inevitably. So maybe near Kate does that. Um, last Can one, we then. do positives from yesterday? Can we do that? Or we're not doing that today. Yeah, well, okay. Everything, every, everything's all been about what if we don't beat West Ham and well, then we've got this and then we've got that and what do we do with this and why should we change that? I thought there were positives yesterday. I what thought they? I thought Dean Henderson in goal was superb. I totally agree with Temps about his distribution. I thought it was outstanding. I actually thought he was one of Forest's best passers yesterday. Of all the players, I'm including the outfield players too. I think others with the red shirt on could have looked at the goalkeeper and passed it as well as him that have been better. I thought Nico Williams down the right was excellent. I thought the cross he put in for Surridge's header was fantastic. And I felt a little bit for Nico because he's come from a team where he picks the ball up on the right and it's, well, do I give it Mo Salah? Shall I go Jordan Henderson? Do I fancy switching it to Sadio Mane? So I'll just knock it back into Matip, who's behind me. I thought he was brilliant. I thought he played really well. I thought Jack Colback looked like he belonged in the Premier League because he'd been there before. So he didn't mind walking out of Newcastle because he played there. So Jack looked like he belonged. I thought that was fine. Um, and and I, I, I thought they stuck at it. You know, it's a positive. They stuck at it. They didn't go under. They stuck at it. You know, Joe was on a, a yellow card early, but he didn't shirk it. He stuck at it and he managed his game. He got through it. It's not easy against St. Maximum when you're on a yellow, but he got through it. So did Nico Williams on that side. And I thought they stuck at it. Mangala coming on was a plus because he looked a little bit more calm in possession. So I thought there were pluses. Crowd was a great plus. The noise they made there, imagine what it's going to sound like at, at the city ground. So, And also the positive is they've got the first one under their belt. They're never going to walk out again after 23 years for the first match away from home. They now know what it feels like. 
They know how big a challenge it is. And you know what it's like. Knowledge is an experience of, it's huge. You know, it's like when you go and stand on the tall diving board for the first time as a kid, and it's five meters down, and you stand up there for about three quarters of an hour, convincing yourself to go. And then when you jump off and it doesn't hurt you, you sprint back up the steps and do it again, don't you? Because you know, you've done it. And now they've done it. They've played a good Premier League team. They've not been blown away. They've been beaten, but fine. And now they go from here. So I think there, there were positives from that trip to St. James's Park. And I think they'll take them into the game at West Ham on Sunday. Yeah, I think defensively they look fine to me. I mean, you know, they soaked up a lot of pressure. Newcastle, it took two tremendous finishes to beat them and Henderson looked good. And I think O'Brien didn't have a great game, but I think there's saw, you saw bits of it there where he can break up play and he is good on the ball. And I think he's going to make the step up really well. And Mangala around him, to me, is going to make a big difference. Although I must admit, I haven't seen much Mangala, but it sounds like he's going to be, people are talking him up and he looks good on the ball. So I do have a lot of hope, certainly. Let me, let me, let me um, so this week, I, I didn't know a great deal about Mangala. So obviously he plays for Belgium. So I thought, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll get hold of Roberto Martinez. <laughs> Can't do that normally on the podcast. I'll, I'll, I'll find out what he's all about. So let me let me let me tell you what he put. Hang on, I'll find it. This yeah. is just you. I, I tried to get. Rubbish, I, tried to get really to, uh, I tried to contact Kevin right. De Bruyne, but he hasn't returned my calls, man. So he, said, <laughs> so he said, "Very interesting player, Oral. He was our best performer for the under 21s in Italy in 2019. Good engine, good steady effect in the game. His best position is as a box to box midfielder." Good technical ability and great temperament on the pitch. Top team player, big potential, intelligent signing. Now, that's a really? difficult international team to get into. Mm. If you've got the manager at that level saying, look, this is the guy that you've got, that really should make Forest supporters feel good about what the future may look like. Might take him a little bit of time to settle in because he's at a, a new club and a new country. But that, I think, is a, is a glowing endorsement of one of the new boys that Forrest had brought in. I felt better when I read it anyway. So, And then when I saw him yesterday, I thought, yeah, he looks all right, yeah. He'll do oh, yeah, he's going to be good, yeah. Temps, who are you texting next week to get us that kind of feedback? Yeah, my, ne my network's not quite as broad as uh, Fletcher's, but yeah. I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah well, you can ask Luke Fletcher what it is. Or I'll get Luke well. Fletcher. I'll get Brody's opinion for you, no problem. But yeah, I mean, look, look everything is for, thoroughly researched and w there's going to be misses, there's going to be hits. That's football. But I like what Fletch said about the, uh, the 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 two boys, Nico Williams and Henderson, have come through clubs with exacting standards, and you don't spend more than six months there unless you are top top end or top top end potential. And for me, the same applies for Lingard as well. We only saw him flashes yesterday, but he's turned up fit without having a preseason. He's come to us with motivation and hunger to be part of the project, and I think we saw glimpses yesterday the passing, the movement, the willingness. Okay, not the execution, not the final performance, but there was enough in there to suggest he's still a player. Henderson's a player. Nico Williams is a player. And the rest will get to that will get to that standard. So, yeah, no doom and gloom for me. I haven't changed a single opinion after that match that I went, it went into that match with. And, yeah, really looking forward to the weekend. Good. Me neither. Right, last word. Fletch, do you want to say anything to finish? Are there any, any more hidden insights from, you know, world-famous <laughs> managers? Yeah, I just had a text from my wife. She said, how long are you going to be doing this for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. What jobs for you to do? Oh, well. I, I just think it's 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 remarkable. I was so excited on Saturday morning. Um, the prospect of, of, of my club being in the Premier League, my city being represented like that, it was a pinch yourself moment. It's cost me a fortune. The kids want all the kits. I think the yellow one's being delivered tomorrow. The red one's already here. I went to the club shop. One of them wanted Warren on the back. The other one wanted Lingard. They'd argued over who was having what. They're going to flip it around for the next one. Uh, I get to the club shop. They've run out of wands. So I couldn't get Lingard done because he's 11. So both had to have Warrell. So they've been arguing about that. My daughter's allowed to wear her shirt when Luke has not got his on and vice versa. Because as a 13-year-old lad, he doesn't want to look like his sister. So... <laughs> The club's already causing chaos in the house, but isn't it great? It's just absolutely magnificent. Match of the day came on, and there we are. And it's like, how oh, good's this? Ian Wright saying, I want Forrest to stay up. Um, 
everything's great. I mean, look, let's just enjoy it. Win, lose, or draw. I, I, and l- l- let me just make this point as well before I bore everybody to death, which I'm, I'm probably prone to do now. What they have done with these signings is if they don't stay up this season, they've got a team that can bring them back next time. So they've, they've, they've got better. I'm confident they're going to stay up. I haven't got a problem. I think they'll stay up. But they've been shrewd enough to buy players that can grow with the club as it goes. They've not got out and got a load of 29-year-olds on massive money, 30-year-olds, just because of who they used to be or could potentially still, still be. Got to got players that can think, we want to grow. The ground's going to get bigger. We're going to get more and more people in. And the players that we've bought are going to go with us as we go. And I think it's a sound idea, sound judgment, and bring on... West Ham. I won't sleep on Saturday. Can't wait for can't wait for Sunday. And uh, I think we'll beat West Ham on Sunday. And then when you speak to me again, you'll be going, "Yeah, sorry for being a bit negative last time. Sorry for that." Yeah, well, I'm not negative. I've sounded negative. I'm not negative. I'm not. Negative. I'm going to end it here because I've got a one bar warning on my internet. Hems has managed to hold it together. I'm talking directly to you. <laughs> <laughs> right, I've got to end it there. There's a one bar thing on my internet saying the signal's going to go. Right, gentlemen, Fletch, thank you very much. Top man. Temps, thank you very much. Can I just yeah, say, it's a pleasure broadcasting with Michael Temple as well. It's been fantastic. It's, well, it's always I, a pleasure. I was going to say, I think I might have rang Fletcher's um, Bertel's radio programme back in the day when I was about 13, 14, when I was a massive Chris Bart Williams fan. All too, right, obviously. all right. Yeah, well, this well, is it. Well, mutual mutual love, Fletch. You're going to get on his bad side as well now. Don't you? Mutual love. We've had a couple of good nights out recently as well. So we it's, good, it's good to spar with him on the on the internet. Yes. Next time I'm on, I want to be on with 10. I'll, I'll make it happen. Right. Thanks very much, everyone. We'll probably be, well, hopefully be back later in the week of the second episode, but if not, definitely back this time next week looking at the West Ham game, which no doubt Forrest are going to win and will be in the company of maybe Temps, maybe uh, Greg or Mikey, and hopefully Gary Bertles, although I haven't asked him yet, but hopefully Gary's free. Right. Thanks very much, everyone, and we shall see you soon. <laughs>